All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Everts, and I am a leadership coach based in the Boston area. As is typical for most training programs in the United States of America, everybody decided to sit at the back. So I am going to move around the room a little bit, except these three people at the front. So congratulations for uh, your bravery. Are we going to have slides? No, we're not going to have any slides. Thank you. Thank you. No slides. Slides distract you from two very important things. They uh, distract you from me, because I'm the one who has all the information and knowledge that I want to share with all of you. And it distracts you from your colleague, the person that you're sitting with. So one of the things I hope that you're going to get out of our program today is a way to raise your visibility and value in your organization and industry is to get to know other people better. So now that you're all comfortably seated, if everyone could stand up. And I want you just to take, you know, five, ten seconds to look around the room. Look at everybody who's here. And I want you to sit down if you know everybody who's here. So if you know everybody who's in this room, sit down. Okay. So that's not great, right? I mean, this is an affiliation group, right? You're supposed to be meeting and knowing other people and looking for opportunities to do that. So we're going to just take a couple of minutes to do it now. So what I'd like you to do is find somebody you don't know, no cheating, and tell them your name, maybe where you work, or if you're in transition, what you're looking to do, maybe where you came from. Just take 30 seconds. I'll tell you break, flip, and then find somebody else. We're just going to do it for a couple of minutes. So go. Find somebody you don't know. Okay, switch conversation if you haven't. Okay, find another person. Break. Break. Find another person you have not yet met. Find one more person, break, scan the room, find somebody else you don't know, find somebody else you don't know. and have a seat. Try to remember where you were sitting. What's that? You're good, yeah. 
this is the hard part, is to get people back to the conference. So try to wrap up and uh, see if you can remember where your seat was. All right, well, I hope you met some folks. Hold on to that for a minute. I hope you met some folks that you uh, hadn't met. I want to give special recognition to this gentleman. What's your first name? It's Rob. Rob. Rob walked all the way across the room to find somebody he hadn't known. So that's a, uh, what's that? And it's not melted. This is, high, this is high quality ice cream. This is high quality ice cream. Okay, I'm gonna be passing out a sheet of paper. And if you could keep it face down on your table, Zelda's gonna do that side. That would be great. So take it and keep it face down. And while I'm doing this, I will tell you that my name is Ed Everts, and I am a leadership coach, team coach, and strategic thinker and planner based in the Boston area. I've been doing this work for about 11 years. And I think I've presented at uh, the PMI conference a couple of times. It's OK if you got extras. Okay. All right, does everyone have one? Keep it face down. Now, this is going to be a uh, project management assessment test because you have to follow these directions. So in a minute, I'm going to ask you to turn it over. Don't turn it over yet. And on the other side, you're going to see a bunch of numbers. Does everyone have a pen, by the way? I think yeah. the gift bag had pens, and Something. there are vendors out there giving out pens and candy. So I'm going to ask you to turn the sheet over, and there are a series of numbers between 1 and 54. Don't turn it over yet, back middle table. <laughs> I said, <laughs> I'll tell you when to turn it over, but when I tell you to turn it over, you're going to see numbers 1 through 54, and I want you to circle them consecutively, meaning Circle one, and then circle two, and then circle three, right? So do it in numerical order. I did this presentation a couple of years ago uh, at a conference in Baltimore, and uh, people didn't follow, and it, my wife was there attending, and she said, Ed, you used the word consecutively. Nobody knows what that means. So <laughs> it's one to two to three, right? Just don't circle all the numbers. I'm going to give you a minute to do it, and don't turn it over yet. Let me get my clock set up. Does everyone have a sheet of paper? Yes. Okay, great, go. One, and then two, and then three, and then four. Circle them in numerical order. Thirty seconds. Ten seconds. This is where nervous laughter starts. Okay, stop, put your pens down. All right, so everybody who got 54, please stand up. What, nobody? How about 44? How about 34? How about 24? Uh, 20? 15, somebody had to, oh, there we go. So how about 16? How about 17? Okay, so turn your sheets back over. And your first name is? Ivy. I Ivy? Ivy. Ivy. I'm Ed. Ivy. Ivy. Hey, I'm Karen. Karen. If you guys, you're not in trouble, but if you can join me in the hallway for a minute, that would be great. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I've got to turn this off so people can't hear me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we'll be right back. Do not look at your sheets of paper. Keep them turned over. Good job. 
Nice job. Hit the one there. So here's how the sheet played out. It's kind of like the Brady Bunch. There's a squ squares. That's okay. That's right. And there's the number. One, two, three, four. Right? You just follow the pattern. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So we're going to go back in. Yeah. I'm going to give everyone another 45 seconds, and I want you guys to try to get to 54. Okay. All right. So just pick up. So you guys had like 16 or something. So you're like I here. I had 19. Oh, you had 19. So I had 17. 17, 18. So there's 19. Right. So then 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. Okay. okay. You following me? So you don't want us to help anyone. You want no, us to just, just keep going. No. Just do it your own. Just do it okay. on your own. Okay. All right. You're not. You're looking. Yeah. Confused. I don't, I don't, yeah. Okay. I'll look. See how great it is. <laughs> Oh, 20. I, yeah, I got there it. it. Is. Goes yep. yeah. Yeah, it goes this okay. way. The okay. one goes it. this way. Gotcha. All right. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Mike's back on. All right. So now we're going to give you uh, another 15, uh, 45 seconds. I'll tell you when you can turn it over. Just calm down. Don't get all... <laughs> You know, we've got all afternoon. <laughs> That's right. Would I mind saying the rules again? So you need to circle the numbers 1 through 54 in order. So 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then 4, and then 5. That's all. That's all. We keep going. No, no, there's no games. There's no gimmicks. It's just... Do we keep over, or do we keep going for more? You just keep going until you get to 54, and then you stop. That's it. No games, no gimmicks. All right, ready? Start where you left off. You guys have had more questions than any group I've done this with, so <laughs> any other questions before we get going? What's that? It's the sugar. It's the sugar. <laughs> and these two tables are fighting. Hey, don't start ahead. I didn't say go. Go. 45 seconds. Go. Pick up where you left off. Ten seconds. Stop. So who got a higher number? Fifty-four. Ivy? Fifty-four. Somebody back here? Suddenly your number didn't seem so high? When <laughs> What's that? You gotta do it in order. Uh, so you two had 54. So who else? Anyone else have in the 50s, 40s, 30s, 30s? Good, great. All right. So this is a very simple exercise. When you know the answer, and so the, I'll tell you in a moment. So the goal of this exercise is to make a point that when you know the answer to something and have information that can help you your likelihood of making progress is greater than if you don't know the answer, right? So I shared with Ivy and Karen out in the hall the answer, which is really very simple. It's kind of like the uh, Brady Bunch. And it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So there's a pattern of how the numbers are laid out. They're just laid out in a way based on their size and the graphics and the order of them that just makes it a little bit more confusing. So I'll give you a minute to process that. Some of you are probably saying, I can't believe how stupid I am that I didn't see that. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. They're in that area. All right. 
So as I mentioned, I do uh, individual leadership coaching and I do team coaching. I also took the 20 years of work experience that I had as a business professional before I went independent and then also listening to my clients and what they experienced, uh, came up with this model that I talked to groups about called Raise Your Visibility and Value. And Raise Your Visibility and Value is all about how to ensure that you are as visible as possible in your organization and industry. So it's not just your company, but your company's industry. And if you are going to be more visible, how you can provide more value. You don't want to be the person who everybody knows, but nobody knows what you do. You want to be the person that everybody knows, and everybody knows how valuable you are. And so we're going to do a few exercises and talk about it uh, this morning as we go, uh, this afternoon as we go through this you know, particular information. So we're going to kind of use this workbook. So again, everyone should have uh, you know, one of two versions, either the smaller binded one or the larger one. They're exactly the same. You can put your name on the front if you'd like. This is a romantic reminder of how you spent Saturday afternoon when it was 80 degrees out and your family's wondering why you're at this conference and not with them. <laughs> Which is what my wife was wondering when I told her the other day what I was going to be doing. So on page two, you know, I talk about some of the lessons that I've learned. And you know, life is really about lessons and experiences that we have. And some of us have different experiences and of course we lead different lives. But you know, the first one is that you have to have some type of motivation to generate some type of action that helps you make progress that gives you a result. I will guarantee you if you are under motivated to go to the gym or to eat well or to stop smoking or whatever these habits might be, you're just not going to ever make progress because it's not going to lead you to action. It's not going to lead you to making progress. We like when there's progress and it's not going to lead you to results. So you have to think about in your certain situation, whether you're a currently employed business professional, so you're actively working, whether you are an independent consultant where you do one-on-one -on -one work with clients, or whether you are in transition, all three of those groups have something in common, which is they have to raise their visibility in whatever industry it is that they're in. Uh, they have to ensure that they're providing value, but it's not going to happen unless they have some type of motivation. So motivation leads to action, and there's a ton of actions. We all want progress. We, you know, someone says to us, hey, how's it going? We want to give an answer that's better than last week. Hey, I'm making good progress. I've got some clarity, right? We want to keep making progress, which hopefully will lead you to the results that you need. The second lesson that I've learned in this work is strategies only will stick if you create them. I mean, I could sit here today and give you a ton of strategies that you could do to raise your visibility and value in your organization and industry, whether you're employed in transition or a consultant. But in reality, the only ones that you're going to do and the only ones you're going to embrace are ones that you create. And so that's what we're going to do today in most of the work we're going to spend is what strategies can I do in my environment in order to be more visible and add more value. I'm not suggesting you're not visible. I'm not suggesting you're not adding value. Everyone has a different story. But all of you are very different in where you are in your career, uh, where you work geographically, the type of company you work at, what exists within those cultures to allow you to be more visible and value. I'm sorry that I'm facing this gray. I'll try to face you guys more often. Um, but you know, only the ones that you guys create are going to stick. And you don't need a ton. So you really only need a handful, like three to five things that you could do a little bit differently to be more effective. If you had a boss today who had a habit that was incredibly annoying and you had the courage to give them feedback and something they could do differently to reduce or eliminate that habit and you saw them trying because they listened to you, you'd feel like a winner. Just one thing, one thing. If that boss had one thing that they did, you would feel like a winner. You don't need 50 to 60 things. Nobody's brain can handle 50 to 60 things. You just need three to five things that you can commit to that you could do a little bit differently to make great, great progress. So if you turn to page four, I want to talk a little bit about this thing called motivation. And I want you to take a couple of minutes and think about the answer to the question, I want or need to have more control over my career development because I want or need the following. And it can be anything. There is no wrong answer. I am going to ask for some folks to raise their hand and share their thoughts. But when you look at your career, and where you want to go and what you want to do, nobody can control it better than you. 
what is it that you need or want in order to make that progress? So take a minute or so to think about the answer and then I'll ask for some brave souls to raise their hand. Okay, take another 30 seconds or so. Okay, so as you're thinking about whether you're going to raise your hand or not, I want to remind everyone that there's a beautiful wedding happening here today in this room, right? As soon as we leave it three, they're going to come in and mix everything up, and it's a beautiful day for a wedding, so that's where they're going to be sitting, I guess, out there. Okay, so who'd love to share what their thought or observation is for themselves? Yes. Can I pause you just for a moment? Can I pause you just for a moment? Yeah. So uh, a new activity that I would love to do today is as I ask you to speak or if you raise your hand is just tell everyone your name and maybe where you work so folks know. We want to take every opportunity that we can to be more visible and this is a great way to let 25 people know who you are. So sorry to pause you but. Sure. Yeah, my name is Jackie Gellner. I um, am in public care administration. I'm currently in a career transition. Okay. So, Right. Great. Well, I love the motivation, right? I mean, there are some things that are general, right? Like I need to be motivated because I need money. Right? I need money to survive, right? But you said a couple of things that I think are uh, clearly important. This is not just about your organization, but it's about your industry. I worked for 10 years at a company called Iron Mountain. I uh, was heads down, blue blooded Iron Mountaineer, and I never belong to any organization, any HR organization. There were plenty of them around. I was in human resources at, you know, during that career. Uh, you know, I only knew the people within my work group and area. I knew lots of people, but you know, those are the ones that I knew the best, right? So when I found myself in transition, I went to a senior HR network group, and in that group there were 25 people who were also in HR, who were also in transition looking for the next opportunity. So it's fantastic that those groups exist. Guess how many people in that group of 25 I knew? Not zero. zero. Not one. I went home to my wife that night and I said, we are in big trouble. <laughs> I said, I didn't know anyone there and I've been in HR for 20 years. You know, how is this possible? So uh, that's great, right? <laughs> it's great that you're here and uh, your next job just right around the corner. It may take a while to find it, but you will. Good. Who else? I saw a few hands earlier also go up. Yes. My name is Suzanne Yerkstis. I work with Duncan Brands. I'm a project manager in ITBMO. Great. You guys are you're like right around the corner. We are. We are. So I um, want to have more control over my career development because I need to feel like I'm making a difference. Great. So a couple of key words that I love there. She wants to have more control over her career development because she wants to feel she's making a difference. Control is important, right? I know many of you may not feel that you are in control of your career because there are only certain opportunities at your organization that you're aware of, but in life you're either a driver or a passenger. And in the work that I do with clients, we work to ensure that they're a driver, which 
which means that they're taking actions and looking for ways in order to ensure that their career is unfolding in the way that they want. There are plenty of people who have been in a job for 10, 20 years and wake up one morning and say, why am I doing this? How did I get here? You know, why am I in this career, in this job, right? They were passengers. They were just going along with the ride. They got promoted. They got moved to a nice office, right? Everything. But it wasn't what they wanted to do. They weren't driving their career and making decisions. So I love that. And then, of course, all of us want to make a difference. There are psychologists who believe that the core behavior of any human being is the desire to leave the world a little bit different than how we found it. And it might be due to a family. It might be due to volunteer work, right? I mean, there's so many different ways to do that. But I think we all want to feel as though whatever we touched or wherever we went or did was a little different than how we found it. So good. How about, yes? That's OK. We won't hold it against you. Um, and we're merging with another company in the same industry. And I'm realizing that, you know, there's a very strong possibility that we're going to decide the oldest employees or the most senior PMs, now we want to phrase it, or both, they can get the same bag for their buck with a cheaper employee. And um, so I have never been good about networking. You know, there are people that I've become personally close to, but I never value just knowing somebody who was saying, oh, gee, there would be. I always felt that was uh, wrong somehow. Uh, emotionally, felt like I was using someone. Um, and now I'm in a situation, and it's, nothing is imminent. Mm -hmm. I'm in a situation of, you know, you better start thinking about this stuff. So you know, like you should have thought about it 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, good. Well, we're not specifically going to be talking about networking today other than the fact that it is an activity that falls under raising your visibility. So in my world, networking is holistic. It's happening all of the time. It's happening everywhere. In technology that exists today, it makes connecting with people so much easier. So much, in fact, it's so much easier we don't even notice it. That you know, if I met one of you today, we can connect on LinkedIn. I can see where you went to school. I can see where you've worked. I can see how long you were there. I, can, I mean, I can learn all about you without even exchanging a word with you. You know, you go back 10, 15 years ago. You know, unless you gave me your resume, I wouldn't have known anything about you. So it's so much, much, much easier. But under the visibility umbrella, there are a number of activities. And raising your visibility is really, in my world, the new version of networking. Networking is an activity under raising your visibility, but there's a number of other ways that you could focus time and energy to connect with people and to be more uh, known and seen in your organization and industry. So good for you. Welcome. All right, how about one more? One more brave soul. Yes? My name is Jeff Philbin, Program Manager at Stone Ridge. We're an automotive component supplier. And I want to have more control of my career development because I want to have more industry flexibility and career portability. We're about to change. We're going through a transition right now in the next three to six months. So now's a good time to look at different opportunities in different industries. Right. Then we kind of pigeonhole into one area. So you said two things that are significantly different. One is career, what was the first phrase? Industry flexibility. Industry flexibility and then career portability. A lot of big words there. Experience, yeah. be able to move into different industries. I, I, I kind of see a relation to what I've done in the past. How do I transition out to different industries? Right, right. A lot of work, just automotive. Yeah, this is coming up more and more in today's workplace, uh, this idea of career portability, which is taking people who are in the top 2% of the company, right, significant leaders in the organization, and having them try something else and having them do something else. So earlier, I was meeting some of you, and I spoke to this lovely participant, Julie, who I warned I was going to call on at some point today. Hello. So hi, Julie. Hello. So can you tell us about uh, I think you've got some great examples about career portability. Can you share that with the group? Sure. Could so, you stand for a moment? Would sure. you mind? Yes. I'm Julie George. I'm with Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. I was in technology for over oh, 30 years, uh, running infrastructure teams. I'm not a project manager, but um, ran project based delivery, production, project systems uh, for many years in my company. 
I just told her 20 minutes ago I'm going to pick on her, and she pulled that story together so beautifully. So <laughs> fantastic. But I think it's just great examples of one of the things that you should be considering, which is saying yes, right? Instead of saying, oh, no, that's not what I do or that's not what I know. If somebody is open to your skill set as to what you provide your organization and industry, say, I'd love to hear more, right? You can always say no at some point, but always say, I'd love to hear more. All right, so if you can turn to page six of your handout, we have something called the risk matrix. And this is where we're looking a little bit about visibility and value. And we can see, because any great consultant, of course, has a force part risk you know, graphic, right? So this is my, and you can see in the bottom, there's low visibility and high visibility. And on the left is low or unknown value and high value. So who'd like to be brave and tell me why I say low or unknown value? Why is that a little bit different? Because yes, sir. Because something you think is, is unknown doesn't mean it's not high value, it's just unknown. It could be low. You got it. It doesn't mean you're not providing value. You just nobody just may know it. Right? I work with clients all the time who get feedback. Ed uh, is not great at, uh, I mean, pick a good example, you know, he's not a great communicator. And so I sit back and t they talk with me and say, Ed, I'm a fantastic communicator. I mean, this is one of my core concepts of being a leader is communicate, communicate, communicate. And so what they find is that typically it's one of two things. Either they're not good at something and they need to work on it, or they're great at it but no one knows it. And so their goals are a little bit different. The goals of someone who's not good at it is to get better at it. The goals of someone who is good at it needs to look at, well, how do I telegraph or make sure that more people know about it so the people who don't think that I'm doing it can see that I'm doing it. So value uh, may be there. It just may be that no one sees it or knows it. And you have to talk a little bit more and look for ways to telegraph and share those thoughts. So you can see somebody who has low or unknown value, right? Their risk for some type of adverse job action is high. 
So the risk matrix has to do with your own kind of personal risk in your organization uh, as, a, as a contributor. Your risk is high if nobody knows who you are and nobody can talk to the value that you have. Uh, if you have high visibility and no one knows what you do, you've got really high risk, right? Because everyone knows who you are, but nobody knows what you do. And your risk there is high. Somebody who has low visibility and high value, it's moderate. Right? They just need to be a little bit more visible, but people know that they provide value, right? So that's something that can be done a little bit more effectively. And of course, high visibility and high value is low. You know, the risk is low because people know who you are and they know the value that you provide. So if there is a reduction in force, if there is a closure, you know, whatever it is that might be, or if there's a promotional opportunity, uh, you know, this is the risk that you might have based on where you are and where you see yourself as your degree of visibility and value. So what I'd love you to do is, and each of you are gonna have a little bit of a different answer and I won't ask for feedback, is draw a dot on this chart when you think about your degree of visibility in your organization and the known value that you provide, where would you put yourself? Red, blue, green, or yellow? Right, just think about that for a minute your degree of visibility in your organization and your degree of value. And I, and I say known value, that others can talk about how valuable you are. There are some positions that you better be visible to others. Uh, the major, like MIT. Can you talk, uh, can you say that a little bit louder for everyone? Yeah, so in some positions, uh, you're not highly visible to the staff or to the people, maybe highly visible to the execs, you're an IT director. You don't want to be highly visible to everybody stopping you in a corridor and asking you to help with this or help with that, or you know, or you know, if you're doing disaster recovery or you're doing certain things that the actions are sort of invisible mm -hmm. because it, you're not highly publicizing what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? So if you work in security and it's like you're pretty low key in terms of your visibility. Mm -hmm. Not that you are invisible to management. Management knows your value, and it's kind of a double-edged sword. Yeah. Look, if you're a security guard at a department store, you better be invisible, right? Yeah. I mean, you don't want anyone to know that you're a security guard at that department store. Yet that security guard also needs to ensure that their leadership team organizationally and the security guard industry know that person really, really well. And they can talk about how they can stay invisible because that's important to them. I, I, I want to ensure that, you know, for purposes of our time today, it's all of your jobs to be as visible as possible with stakeholders, boards of directors, leadership in your organization. Nobody here should be invisible unless it's part of your job, right? What you're talking a little bit about also is visibility, but then performance management, which is, well, if I'm so visible, Ed, everyone's going to be stopping me all the time to ask questions or et cetera. And that is a little bit different. That is performance management, where I now need to dictate parameters and uh, roles and limitations and how people and when people can you know, connect with me, et cetera. So, uh, after the workshop in the book I've written, I talk about specifically how to set parameters and how to ensure that, to your point, you're not so visible, which I don't think is conceptually possible, so visible that you can't get any work done because everybody's you know, attacking you all of the time. All right, did everyone place a dot somewhere? I yes? I just wanted to comment on that. So I've seen in some organizations that um, as people that are not as visible in those roles, they need to be more visible because when there are no security breaches, for instance, in technology or projects are running smoothly and nobody's complaining about that, they're actually doing a ton of work to make that happen. And I think um, when nothing's happening in those spaces, that's when they should talk and be more visible so that people understand that they are doing things behind the scenes to really show how much work they're doing. Because when nothing's happening, no one notices, so it's not like a blip on up or down. And I think that people get missed in that middle. Sure. Yeah, I mean, at a conference like today, 
if everything got done perfectly and no one ever saw anyone who was doing it, you would think it's fantastic. It's like, oh my God, everything got set up, everything was organized, I didn't even see anybody doing it all, but it all got done, right? So those people aren't desired to be seen, but the clientele, their leadership, want to hear that great feedback because that's the visibility that they're looking for. All right, I want to, uh, so if everybody did that, I want to just do, uh, keep going. So we're going to go to page seven. So I do want to talk just for a couple of minutes about the difference between networking and raising your visibility and value. So if you could take a minute and think about your definition for networking. So how do you define networking? And I apologize, I keep going to the back of the room and looking out the door because I'm looking for my table volunteers who are gonna be working out there and I just need to make sure that they've arrived, so. But take a minute just to think about, you know, what is your definition for networking? And I will ask a few folks to share their definitions. Okay, take another 30 seconds. The table volunteers are here, yay! Okay, who'd like to share their definition of networking. I'd love to hear from people who we haven't heard from yet. Yes. Pause for a moment, please. Pause for a minute, please. What's your name? That's okay. Hi, my name is Michelle Ainsworth. Great. Um, I define networking as communicating with others inside my industry or sometimes outside my industry that I can communicate and collaborate with. Okay, great, great. Who else? Bob. Bob Hughes, uh, Stormridge, uh, in Massachusetts. I have a short definition, but I have established uh, associations with others based on common interests, or actually something what they have in common. So I think you have networks with your family, you have networks with church groups, you have networks with uh, your peers in, in the industry. So there's, there's all levels of networks, but the, the thing they the thing, that, uh, the thing that makes them the same is that you have some commonality with them in some way, shape, or form. And there's association. The level of association can vary. Some you have closer association, some you have more distance association. But if you have an association, I would say it's Okay, great. Thank you. Who else? Yes. Yes, or what I might do is give them my mic as they're talking. Sorry, thank you. Uh, yeah, I guess we could use this device. Hello, is it working? It is. Okay. All right, welcome to Oprah. <laughs> We're gonna walk around with the mic. All right, who else has a definition for networking? All right. Sure, let's get the mic. Yeah. All right. It's Kevin Kelly. What's the matter? 3642. IBM through our 3642. There's six numbers. And I define networking as connecting with people face to face or through LinkedIn, or through these PLI mass conferences, and engaging with them in a positive manner to be helped or to help them professionally or personally. Okay, good. Right. Good. So you talked about LinkedIn, which I love that. All right, I need a couple of more. Yes, you look anxious to say something. I love this mic now. 
Oh, me? Yeah, you. I wasn't. But <laughs> My name is Hardik Patel. To me, uh, networking is connect with the others in order to expand your connection in any area, whether it's a social or uh, professional. Okay. So basically, as we say, LinkedIn or Facebook. Okay. Facebook gets socialization, but it can still advance your network. Sure. For folks who are looking to expand their visibility, technology is critical, and platforms like LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter are all ways. You don't have to use them all, but are all ways to do that. All right, how about one more? Come on, Phil Donahue here wants to walk up with his mic. Yes, Diane, right? Yes, Diane Matthew. I think of networking is much more simple or high, depending on how you want to look at it. It's, to me, networking is talking, contacting, or you know, communicating with people in any way, shape, or form that we have available to us. Just reaching out to folks. Okay, great. Great. All right, so thank you. So turn to page eight of your uh, book. And on page eight, what I want you to do is answer that question. Most people would think of George Washington as blank. This is like the match game. Most people would think of George Washington as blank. So take a minute or so, uh, 30 seconds or so to write down your quick answer. Okay, so at the top of your voice, because I can't run around fast enough, what are some answers to that question? Most people would think of George Washington as blank. Yes? A leader. A leader. How many had a leader? Okay, so that was somewhat popular. What else? Father of this country. Father of the country. How many had something like that? Okay. What else? First president of the United States. First president of the United States, of course he was, for all those uh, history buffs. How many people had that? Okay. What else? Uh, I had cherry tree chopper. <laughs> 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 Rob, what, con what, country do you, uh, what company do you work for? I work for a company called Mindcast. So Rob is the humorist at Mindcast, I think. <laughs> I think he is the, uh, the man who brings humor. Yeah, cherry tree chopper, absolutely. <laughs> Anything else? You might found some old email. <laughs> Anything else? All right, so if you go back to the definition that we heard about networking, if you go back to the definition that we heard about networking, there were some common themes, right? We heard about connecting. We heard about other people, right? There's generally a very consistent definition that we apply to networking not much differently than the very common definitions that we apply to George Washington. So I've done this exercise a number of times and almost everybody gives the same answers you guys gave, right? The only one I didn't hear was uh, Martha Washington's husband or uh, wooden teeth, you know, the, the legend of his wooden teeth, right? But we almost always give it the same definition. And it's important in these days, I don't know why, I'm it's important in these days that we uh, think about it a little bit more broadly. So what is the broadest way that you can think about George Washington? I'm sorry? Broader. Broader. Yep, human being, right? No one ever says, you know, he's a man or he's a human being. We always have these very limited definitions. And so this is the difference between networking and raise your visibility. In networking, we have a very common definition around it's connecting with others, right? It's going to Starbucks and having a cup of coffee, my industry, other industries, looking for commonalities. It's a great definition, there's nothing wrong with it, but what I want all of you today to think about a little bit more is, you know, how do I raise my visibility? You know, why is George Washington not just the first president of the US or a cherry tree chopper, that's a tongue twister, but he uh, is a human.
He is a human being. And that's what Raise Your Visibility does. Networking is one activity, only one activity that you can do in order to be more visible. There are a million other ways, bless you, there are a million other ways for you to be more visible in your organization. So for me, networking is defined as any activity, any activity that raises my visibility in my organization and industry. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what some of those might be. Can you guys hear me okay? Is the mic, okay. So we're gonna talk a little bit in a few minutes about what some of that might be. So let's talk a little bit about value, because as I said earlier, we not only wanna talk about visibility, but also talk about value. So if you go to page 11, I'd like you also to take a minute or two and think about how you define value. I define value in the workplace as blank. So take a couple of minutes to, to do that. Okay, take another 30 seconds or so. Okay, who'd love to share a definition of value? And again, I'd love to hear from some folks that we have not heard from yet. Yes, Ivy, hold on. Sorry. Ivy Bueno, the community builder, so design and construction. Um, I define value as being able to offer unique expertise, knowledge, and perspective that's critical to advancing corporate objectives. Okay, great, thank you. So I'll hand over here. Let me go back to her first. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Judy from the Bar One Call Care Management. I, I simplified it as just a positive contribution. Okay, good, thank you. Hey, Karen Sierra from New Orleans. Uh, I demand value in the workplace as a meaningful contribution to the goals of the company. Okay, good. Any others? Yes. Hi, Ioana Zahir, Boston University. I define value as doing a job right and growing and helping others to grow. Okay, great, thank you. One more. <coughs> I define value as contributing to agreed upon goals. Okay, it was contributing to agreed upon goals. Right, so again, we heard some common definitions amongst value uh, in respect to value in the workplace. Here's the difference with value. You know, visibility, as we go through an exercise in a few minutes, uh, can be very tangible and very specific. So I can be more visible if I speak and talk at a company lunch, right? That's something I can do, makes me more visible. I can take 10 seconds to introduce myself. And now dozens of people might know who I was where before they may not have. Value is a lot more intangible. It varies from organization to organization. It varies based on the culture of those organizations. It's much, much more intangible. Yet, all of you can take time to identify what's valuable at your particular organization. So we have people here from Mimecast, and we have people here from the Federal Reserve, and I don't know, maybe there is somebody here from Nordstrom's. But you know, each of those organizations value different things. You know, if this was a call center company, you know, we would have boards with metrics running that show how long you're on each call and uh, you know, how many calls you've taken, right? Because that's how they're measuring success because they want to get through as many people as positively as possible, right? 
that's not something that you're going to find at the Federal Reserve, I hope, showing you know, how fast we're talking to people, et cetera. So value is much more unique in respect to your organization and industry. And as you can see on page 13, good performance does not necessarily equal business value. You did not hear anybody give a definition of, well, as long as you're doing a great job, you're providing business value. I will tell you, when I hosted that uh, networking group of senior HR leaders, almost all of them would have said, I was surprised it happened to me. I was helping, I was doing great work, blah, 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 and I'm surprised that it happened to me because in some cases, not all, they mistook the fact that they were a good performer as someone who is providing business value. But they didn't flip the equation and say, well, what is the value of this business? You know, how do we measure ourselves professionally? What do we talk about on the Wall Street you know, board uh, calls in respect to how our business is going, and what can I do to tie myself to those as tightly as possible. So if you go to page 14, you'll see a chart that talks a little bit about the types of value that you can think about contributing at your organization. These don't fit for everybody, and it also is role dependent and culture dependent. The first level is individual value, and this is something everybody can provide. So all of you can provide individual value at your organization. I guarantee you, if you were to talk to a CEO and say, who's your most valuable employee, nine times out of 10, they would say, it's my executive assistant. <laughs> you know, it's this person, it keeps me on track, gets me to where I need to be, reminds me what I need to do, right? I'm saying that metaphorically, I'm not, I, I'm not a sociologist, I haven't uh, you know, spoken to a thousand CEOs to ask that question, but my impression would be, that that is something that they would all say because that person provides individual value to that organization. All of you should know what individual value you provide your organizations. Now the trick is that the organization doesn't think about it from a value perspective. The job posting that you responded to to work there, your job description, you know, doesn't always talk about value. Talk about what you need to do and what skill sets you need to have, but it doesn't talk about here's how you provide value with this organization. So you need to go back to those organizations. You need to have a conversation with your boss and say, hey, I love my job. Thanks for the great raise. You know, thanks for you know, uh, all the things that we're doing together. You know, I'd love to figure out how I can provide more value at the organization. Is that a conversation that you're willing to have? The I'm sorry? The second level of it is uh, business value, which is uh, value tied to, uh, I'm sorry, next one is financial drivers. So it's value, there's two levels, there's individual value and business value. The next level is financial drivers, right? So these are uh, drivers that are tied to internal financial metrics. So again, all of you should be knowledgeable on, for your particular organization and your unique industries, how we measure success. Some of them are easy, like gross margin and revenue, right? Those are basics. But there may be some other metrics that your organization utilizes to evaluate success that you need to know about. And you need to ensure that the work that you're doing to the degree that you can, can be tied to it. It can't always, right? There's this thing called line of sight, which is, you know, how do I connect to these certain things? And those certain things may be so far off, it's impossible for me, et cetera. But quite frankly, even talking with your boss about it or exploring it and raising your interest in it is way better than not doing that at all. So what are the financial drivers that drive your organization? And the last level are uh, value tied to external marketplace factors, right? And this is a pyramid for a reason because as you go up the pyramid, fewer and fewer people can be impacted by it. So the top level has to do with external you may not have any contact with the ex external world in the job that you're doing. Um, but you know, these are people who know certain things that can influence the value of the company. So I mentioned earlier I worked at Iron Mountain. Paper price was an important financial metric to Iron Mountain. Anybody know why? Anybody know what Iron Mountain did? It's yes. stock management. What's that? Documentation. Documentation management. So what happens when paper price goes up? Yeah, fewer people use paper. And if they use less paper, people store less. It impacts our revenue. If paper price is cheap, everyone's going to be using it and revenue goes up, right? You know, that's not something as an HR person I would have cared about or known about, but it was a huge, important financial metric that leaders of the organization need to be aware of and work on. So you may have, in your industry or organization, 
things like that that are very important to how you do business that you need to know and be aware of. So if we go to page 15. On the left, you know, there's two columns here. One is good performance and the other is business value. And remember my model that good performance does not equal business value. What are some, take a couple of minutes and list, what are some words or phrases you might hear in the workplace that describes good performance? I've given you some examples like dedicated, hard worker, timely. You know, what are some words or phrases that you've seen on performance reviews or if you got an employee of the quarter award that they use to describe you? You know, what are some words or phrases that you've heard? And write those on the left and I'll ask folks to shout them out. Take a minute to just think about them and then we'll uh, shout them out. Take another 30 seconds or so. Okay, pens down. I just like saying that because <laughs> I feel like it's like we're taking the SAT. Pens down. I don't know if anybody knows what this is. This is a thermo flask. If you're a member of uh, Costco, you can get these at uh, Costco, set of two. Keep your, cold, your drink cold for hours. Hours, so I'm a big fan. Anyway, but, what's that? <laughs> no commission checks, I just figured I'd share. I did not bring enough for everyone, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but they're fantastic. All right, so what are some words, just yell them out, that you have heard in your workplace that describes good performance? Engaged. Engaged. Results oriented. Results oriented. What's that? Positive attitude. Positive attitude. Team player. Team player. Collaborative. Exceeds expectations. Collaborative. Collaborative. Reliable. Reliable. Good communicator. Good communicator. Innovative. Innovative. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. Adaptable. Adaptable. I wrote down within budget and high quality. Yeah, very important, right? I mean, people love things that are within budget and still produce high quality. So these words and phrases are very common, right? We hear these all the time in respect to performance reviews. Job descriptions are filled with them, right? It's like, oh my God, let's create the most perfect person ever, right? And say, fantastic collaborator, team player, communicator, right? Fantastic written and verbal skills, blah, 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 blah. And yet, uh, that can be a little bit challenging. So that's, you know, those are the aspects of good performance. And I talk about it because you know, the model assumes that you're a good performer. You know, this won't work in raising your visibility and adding value if you're having trouble within your current role or your current opportunity. So you need to be somebody who is doing a good job. You need to be a good performer. Because if you're not a good performer, it means that either you need to get to be a good performer or find some place where you can be, right? Not every job that we get hired into is a perfect fit and can work for us, and we might decide at some point as a driver of my career that this job is not taking me in the direction that I hoped and I need to find something else, that's okay. But you know, whatever it might be, you've got to ensure that you're a good performer. Now on the right side of the chart, we show business value. So this is where I want you to think about your company and industry. And I will ask from some volunteers here. What are some ways that your company measures or articulates value for them. You know, what is the business value that they look at to kind of beat their chest and say, look how fantastic we are. So take a minute to do that. I gave you some examples. Those are easy ones.
Okay, take another 30 seconds. Okay, who'd like to share a uh, you know, label or a way that your organization or industry measures value? Uh, customer satisfaction. Customer satisfaction, right? We can go out and uh, survey customers. We may have numbers that we collect and we want to see a certain percentage, right? And we can tout those that, hey, like for example, I have a client who runs an uh, insurance organization and every year they talk about their retention rate. Right? We keep 98% of the you know, accounts that we've had year to year, right? It's a big number to them because they think it tells a lot. I saw a hand back here. Um, consistently receiving drug approvals. So for us, it's a big factor, no critical findings. Right. We have to clear inspections to get the drug in the market, so we're always looking for no criticals. We certainly hope so, that you have to <laughs> get through those, right? So we measure our success rate, right? If we're makers of drugs, we want to be able to tell folks that, hey, in the history of our organization, we have never had a negative finding, for example, right? So, did you have a? High employee satisfaction. High, employee. high employee satisfaction, right? So in addition to going out to customers, uh, a lot of people, including, uh, who's the guy that owns the airline? Richard. Yes, what's his name? Richard. Richard, right. Right, he would say you have to keep your customer, your employees happy first because they're the ones that represent you to the uh, the clients, right? So don't you want to keep your clients happy, but the people you have to keep happy first are your employees, so they can always put their best foot forward. We can do that by measuring their employee satisfaction, and if we're in an industry where we can talk about that, that would be great. Was our hand up over here of another idea? Yes. Um, anticipate uh, the customer marketplace. Okay, so can. You Give me an example of what that might mean. Uh, so, if you are in a, um, say, I'm in a healthcare innovation type environment. Okay. So, trying to understand what the marketplace is, where it's going, and being able to make recommendations about to our customers about things that they can you know, improve on or ways they can collect data. Okay. Great. Right. So, this is something that, especially industry wide, that you might want to share yeah. to say, hey, look how good we are. Right. Yes. So, we work uh, collaboratively. IT operations team and application support team, so keeping the servers up time high or keeping the system running all the time. So we measure the percentage of uptime for each application or servers monthly, weekly, or by weekly or something. Right, right. So you want to ensure, you know, nobody likes those examples. I think we hear about them once or twice a year where an airline system goes down, right? and suddenly nothing is taking off, right? It wasn't a planned outage, it was an unplanned, right? So we want to be able to talk about our success rate and keeping our servers active, right? How about one more? Yes. So in, in my role, we're um, working the product and um, so I was an external type of um, business value. So what we're trying to do is, um, as a leader catalyst, to increase the visibility of synthetic identity payments fraud and influence the industry to mitigate it in your own organization. So it's something you can't really measure, but trying to get people on board to understand the issue. Good, great. You raised your hand. Uh, yeah. How about one more? So increase, I work for an insurance company. Okay. So increase profitable, profitable membership and decrease administrative costs. Right, right. Uh, all organizations want to increase revenue and decrease costs, right? sometimes unfortunately, right, in respect to the direction that they might go in. So here's the point, you know, we could go on forever and we could hear endless examples of ways that your organization or industry might provide value. You should know within your particular role, within your particular organization, how they measure value because you want to then see if you can tie that value, tie your role to that value. So if there's any takeaway from today, it would be for you to schedule a time with your boss to talk about how you can tie the work that you're doing more to value. And when I say more, I mean closer, it may not be right on it, but more to value because you want to be seen as a valuable contributor at your organization. 
Now, your boss might have one of three responses. They might say, absolutely fantastic idea, let's talk about it. They might say, absolutely, hey, I need to think about it a little bit, so can we schedule something in a couple of weeks? Or they might look at you like the proverbial doe in the headlights, like, what? You want to, right? Because this is such a unheld conversation in most corporations. I mean, when's the last time you as a leader had someone come to you and say, hey, I want to talk about how I can provide more value to the organization. Is it impossible? No, I'm sure it has happened, but it doesn't happen a lot. So take the time to do that with your boss and uh, you know, focus on that. So as we can see on page 16, it's not the, yes. I just yes. wanted to sure. comment on your comment. So um, in many of the groups or areas that I've seen, especially in the PMO areas, it's like we have to um, explain to the company what business value we're bringing to them. So it starts out from us as an organization, not going to ask my boss, you know, value I'm bringing. It's me coming to and saying, this is the value we bring to the organization. Is this the direction you want to go in? Mm -hmm. So I would actually be more um, hesitant to go to my boss and ask him what value I'm providing rather than saying, this is the value I believe I'm providing. How do you feel about that? And then right. coming with a um, solution rather than asking a question. Great. Look, uh, from my perspective, as long as you and your boss are talking about value, that's a huge plus because it's not happening as much in organizations as it should. And whether you're sharing, here's how I provide value, or asking, how can I provide more value, as long as you're having the conversation, you know, that's a huge plus. So page 16, it just redoes that graphic where I say good performance does not equal business value. A valuable employee is somebody who is doing a good job and is providing individual or business value to the organization. And so for me on page 17, my definition of value are any activities that connect individual contribution to business performance. Page 17, any activities that connect individual contributions to business performance. And for those of you, uh, those of you that are hard of hearing, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Any activities, any, any activity that connect individual contribution, that's the work that you're doing, to business performance. There are many definitions for value. I'm not suggesting that's the best or only, but that's the one that I use when I work with folks. So, trick, not a trick question, but what do you think the most important word in that statement is? Connect. Connect. You got it. You got to look for ways to connect the work that you're doing to the value of your organization. Not always possible. I'm not saying if you're going to do it, you know, you might see it's too far away. But I mean, even having the conversation with a leader or boss would be significant. All right. So let's go back to visibility. So we only have about uh, 20 more minutes, so take a minute. How do, you how do you define visibility? So when you think about visibility with your, in your organization, take a minute to write down your definition of how you define visibility. Take another 30 seconds. Pens down. No, I'm just kidding. 
So how, a couple of examples about uh, visibility. What's a good, or what's the definition you use to define visibility? Yes. What's that? Sure, because I'm sure none of us can remember your name. Hold on a second, it's got to turn on. There you go. I define disability as uh, people know who you are, what you do, and have a strong, good perception of how well you do your work. Okay, so I love that. Who you are, what you do, and have a good perception of the job that you're doing. If I knew that, you know, that example we did when we first stood up and you guys hadn't met each other completely, you know, if I knew at my organization that people knew who I was, what I did and my reputation was such that it was you know, pretty good, yeah, I think I'd feel pretty good about that. Who else, who else has a definition for visibility? Come on, people. All right, keep it close to your mouth. Well, what I wrote was correct understanding and favorable opinion of your role by colleagues and supervisors. Right, so what Diane's talking about is Reputation, right? So to me, reputation are the words and phrases people use to talk about you when you're not there. So after you give a PowerPoint presentation to a group and you move on to your next meeting, I guarantee you two people are saying, hey, what do you think? How do you think they did? And you want it to be positive, right? So reputation is something we're going to talk about. It's something that you should be spending time on uh, all of the time in your workplace. How about one other definition of uh, visibility? said by the extent by which individuals are known either favorably or unfavorably by others throughout the organization. Great. Great. So we're talking a little bit in these definitions of visibility about reputation. So in the book and in the model that I work on, the visibility is comprised of two parts. One is presence. So it's the visibility that you have within the organization that people see you. And so we talk a little bit about uh, you know, not sending an email to the person who sits in the cube next to you, right? but actually, oh my god, getting up and saying, hey, can I chat with you for a minute? It's about you know, the classic manage by walking around, leaders who spend a certain amount of each day actually walking their building or walking their plant or walking their health center and talking with people and say, hey, how's it going? Hey, what's something we could be doing differently here that we're not doing today that would be more effective, right? talking with them and engaging those types of relationships. So on pages 20 and 21, we won't, and 20, yeah, 20 and 21, we won't go through them today, but there are seven visibility accelerators that are described in the book that all of us should think about in an effort to raise our visibility. Introduce yourself, so I actually will talk about them for a minute. Introduce yourself. We are horrible at introducing ourselves. I went to a soccer dinner or meeting for my daughter like 10 years ago and it was held at somebody's house and there were tons of parents there and kids and this was a hey we're getting the soccer team together and let's talk and everything nobody introduced anybody that was there the owners of the house didn't come and greet us and welcome us it was like we weren't even there we were invisible right so for whatever reason we all do this when we go to meetings we don't necessarily introduce ourselves to the people at the table uh, you know, when we sit at a, 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 a meeting at work and we might sit next to somebody that we haven't worked with, we don't take a minute to introduce ourselves. So behavior number one is looking for ways to ensure that you're all, always introducing yourselves to others you don't know. Because quite frankly, if you're not doing it, nobody is. Nobody is sitting there saying, oh, there's uh, Jeff, uh, yeah, he's, uh, nobody's doing that. tell your name and your profession or what you do and I don't see that anymore uh, you know you are an exception here today but in general mm -hmm. that approach kind of changed it's like everybody's more on LinkedIn now mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. uh, you know they, yeah and some companies have their online. own yeah. right some companies have their own LinkedIn platform right where you can go in and look up colleagues and see their strengths and weaknesses and areas of opportunity etc but bottom line is a key behavior to raise your visibility is ensuring that you're introducing yourself. Second and third, you need to be accessible, meaning 
you don't become the black hole of the organization that if someone sends you an email, you may not have the answer or you may not be able to get back to them, but respond quickly saying, really busy today, I'll get back to you tomorrow. I mean, that's much better than nothing. As an independent consultant, I can give story after story of outreaches I've done to business professionals and I don't hear back. I don't hear back. So I don't know what's going on, right? Do they hate me? You know, it's the glass half empty. I'm filling it up with my own stories. Uh, so you need to ensure that you're accessible and you also need to ensure that you're responsive. So in my world, is kind of a revolving door that people will come to you and then you have to get back to people. And you can be responsive in a number of ways. It might be, hey, I'm not the right person, but if you go to this person, they might be able to help you. You know, there's a number of ways that you can be responsive in the organization, but don't become a black hole. You have to interact with others one-on-one. -on -one. And so there's discussion about how you can interact with others one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's your boss, whether it's other colleagues, other people in other industries, et cetera. On page 21, participate with a purpose. This has to do with you with groups. So this, for example, is a great participate with a purpose example. Not every project management professional is here today or here yesterday, right? So you're already ahead of the game because now you're with a ton of colleagues from different organizations and what a great way to meet and work with them. Second, you need to engage with industry associations. So fantastic as well that you're all a member of this organization and there are different ways to engage with the industry organization. <clears throat> you can be a member, you can be a board member, you can be on a panel, right? There's different ways to engage to raise your visibility. And then you need to manage your reputation, which means you need to be a driver of how people are seeing you in the workplace. So you need to be thinking about, and industry, thinking about you know, how are people perceiving me how do I want to be today? If I go to that PMI meeting on a Saturday, you know, do I want to be highly interactive and make sure that I meet and say hi to everybody that I can? Do I want to you know, sit in the corner with my cell phone and just get through the meetings and not worry about you know, meeting anybody? You know, who do I want to be? How do I want to behave? But you need to ensure that you're managing your reputation. If you look on page 22, we're just going to do this live and loud because uh, I want to ensure that we finish up on time. What are some ways in your workplace can you manage your presence, right? So this is the tangible connections that people have with each other. This is about physically being visible. So what are some ways in your workplace that you can, or things that you can do to have high presence or be physically uh, visible? Rob. I like your idea about walking around. Okay. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, hard to do. Hard to find time. It's, it's amazing, right? I know lots of people who say, oh, Ed, so what I've done is I block time in my calendar every week, and that's when I'm going to walk. I say, okay, let's check on that in a month and see how that goes. A month later, how'd it go? Terrible. You know, people kept coming in. I never could leave my office. Meetings got scheduled. You know, it's just, so it's hard, right? It's not easy to do, but if you have the right motivation, you'll have the right action. Yes. Mm -hmm. So even the most senior vice president is sitting at a table just like this, but right. one big family. Yep. So every time somebody comes down the corner, it's like cheers. Hey, Norm. Hey, Steve. <laughs> hey, Bob. <laughs> it's all day long, no matter what time you come Quit. So Go elsewhere. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, so, so everybody wears a headset, and every week there are two or three group lunches. It's always one big powwow. So mm -hmm. every day, you could switch floors and eat somewhere else. So it's like, a, you know, we're still like, we're a mid-sized company still behaving like a small company. Mm -hmm. So if we were the reverse, we're like, you don't even know who really important because you're socializing yeah. so much. How yeah. does that work when you're trying to find your value when there's too much socialization? So what you're describing has to do with culture. And so culture does vary from organizations to organizations. I'm sure most of you are shaking your head listening. That's not how our company is at all, right? I mean, I don't even know the names of the people who are coming around the corner, et cetera. So uh, when I talk with people, I correlate culture to a poker hand. And so if any of you are familiar with poker, you know, someone shuffles the deck to create kind of anonymity and flexibility amongst the cards. And then everyone is dealt a hand. And your hand is one of three things, uh, one of two things, right? You either have a good hand or you have a bad hand. And regardless of whether you have a good hand or bad hand, it doesn't matter, you only have three choices. You can either fold, 
and you could decide that this is not the right place for me, I've done everything I can to fit in, whatever it might be, but I need to move on to someplace else. You can do what most of my clients do, which is bluff, which is to make pretend that it's better than it is. And bluffing is a brilliant strategy if you have to do it by ne next Monday, but it's not a great long-term strategy because at some point someone's gonna call, you don't have a hand and the whole thing collapses. Or you can take action, right? You can do things and take steps in order to influence what's going on in the organization. So what you're describing is a culture, right? And so what I tell people is, whether you have a good hand or bad hand, it's the hand you have, right? So now, what do I do, right? I need to take action. You know, I've got a great hand, I fit in well, everything's fantastic, you know, whatever, or I don't have a great hand, right? And so what do I need to do in order to make progress? So that's a whole nother workshop. But, uh, you know, uh, in a essence, uh, I don't know the answer to your question. Can I suggest Sure. So we, and my company too, we have an open call for and we use stream resources. People come in late, I go in early, but as soon as they come, they're like, should be time to call or whatever, right? Put on my headphones. So they know I'm trying to focus. As soon as, and that's like an unspoken ethic, like a work thing we do, like anybody, anytime you see anybody with a smartphone, then they're trying to focus. Again, most of us are going, you know, you are so lucky. <laughs> it's like, what a problem to have that everyone's so happy and positive that. But you want to get away. You're like, I know, I know. Like, I just want to escape from work yeah. sometimes. I want to know how you get any work done. All right, we need to wrap up here in general, but one other point. I have a different scenario. I work from home. Okay. So being remote, the presence is very difficult. It is. Yeah, so for you, presence is even more important, right? Because you're not working in an environment where people see or meet you. So you have to create those opportunities. So, you know, I tell people anytime, if, I don't know if your boss is in town or from another town, but you know, anytime your boss is in town, ensure that you have time to check in and see how it's going. Go to any employee meeting, go to any team meeting. You've got to specifically look for ways to be visible. When you're in a corporate office, it's easier, right? Hey, there's a meeting in 10 minutes, Jeff, I'll be right there. You may not even hear about it, right? So you have to be more purposeful to drive it, right? And uh, if you're more purposeful, I'm sure you can find lots of ways to do it. It creates some challenging, right? Commute issues or uh, you know getting there on time and those types of things. But uh, it is something that you have to be more purposeful. I work from home, so similar for me, right? I have to look for ways to be more visible in my organization and industry. So I just want to jump, if we can, to page 26. I apologize, but we do need to wrap up. So I do want you to leave with an idea. Remember I said earlier that even one idea can be helpful? So I want all of you to think about what's one thing you can do to be more visible within your organization. What's one thing you could do? And this is a real thing. This isn't a dream or a wish or, you know, et cetera. And as you're thinking about that, I'm going to be passing out a free gift. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. It's my special poker deck of cards that talk about how whether you've got a good hand or a bad hand, it's the hand you got. And what am I going to do about it? Too many people love complaining about the bad hand that they have, but they don't do anything. And if you do have a bad hand, you need to do something different than what you're doing today in order to make a difference. All right, so who'd love to share an idea that they have that they can do in the workplace different than they're doing today to be more visible? In the workplace or just in general? I'll take anything at this point.
Absolutely. I would tell you right now that there are more industry meetings going on tonight in Boston than any of us could ever attend. There are so many happening. It's unbelievable. And not just social events or leadership, uh, industry events, but training classes, right? There are so many activities out there that it's easy. So when you get home tonight, Google project management, affiliation groups, or what your industry might be, whether it's healthcare or uh, you know, whatever it might be. Did I miss any table? Did you guys get? Okay. Uh, you know, Google it and you'll see it and you'll be able to have a big difference. Okay, what else? You know we're running late when they're cleaning off the tables and we're <laughs> kind of like the waiters coming and taking plates yeah, yeah. and uh, cups and everything while we're still sitting there. <laughs> What's another idea? So affiliation groups, huge guys. Yes? Um, I liked your idea about asking your manager or boss what, uh, how you can add more business value? Yes, ask your boss, uh, talk about value at your organization. It's a great conversation to have. Even if they're dough in the headlights, say, hey, maybe this was surprising for you to ask, for me to ask about this, but if you could think about it a little bit, let's meet in a couple of weeks and let's really talk about it because I want to ensure that I'm doing everything I can to add as much value to this organization. If I owned a company and I knew all my employees were walking around trying to find out how they could provide more value, I'd be thrilled. I'd be like, wow, that's fantastic. So it's a good conversation to have for whatever reason I don't know. We don't do it, but it's great to do. How about one more? Write a book. What's that? Book. I did not pay her to say that. So. <laughs> but when you go outside, my two lovely daughters, who I am not paying to come, but uh, volunteer to help, and one of their boyfriends, are out there, uh, and if you'd like to buy Raise Your Visibility and Value, that would be great. I'm going to give away a free copy. I'm going to give it away to my new friend, Rob. Oh, thank you, sir. Is, I love the fact that he's the humorist. Okay, last closing words. Uh, it's been great speaking with all of you. Uh, you know, we didn't have a ton of time today, yet I think if you can think about how can I be more visible in my organization and industry? The ideas are out there. You just need to identify them. Don't be seduced into thinking you don't need to work on it, especially in today's fast-paced environments. Jobs come and go, companies come and go, uh, the role that you're in could come and go, right? You need to ensure you're as visible as possible in your organization and industry, which includes networking. And then you've got to identify what is valuable to your organization. You know, how do we measure success? And then what can I do in order to tie myself? If you're highly visible and highly value, your risk goes down, right? In respect to bad activities that might be going on in the workplace. All right, any questions? Or what questions might you have? All good presenters are told to ask that question at the end, so I just wanted to try to see uh, that. Uh, yes, I Rob. Have a question. It's not a joke either, but there's almost an assumption that you're a certain personality type. Like, you know, I find more extroverted, of course, the humor thing. But like, what if what if you're more introverted? Is there a strategy that you talk about in the book, which I'm going to read? It's another selling point, but. Uh, you know, is it finding a mentor within your organization, or is there yes. just for people that aren't as comfortable? Do you have any parting words about those? Yes, my parting word would be if you have a preference for introversion, which many of you might, find an extrovert. Find somebody who is, you know, coming in, much to this individual dismay, every Monday morning saying, hey guys, how was your weekend? Hey, what did you do this weekend? Hey, this is what I did this weekend, and they blah, 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 and everyone thinks they're not getting any work done because all they're doing is talking. Find that person and say, how do you do this? You know, how do you do this? That's just a simple example, but that's a way that you can emulate. It's not easy. Uh, introverts who are trying to be extroverted, and so I have a preference for extroversion, so from time to time I have to manage myself to be more introverted. It's exhausting. Uh, it's exhausting for an introvert to be extroverted. You know, they'll go home and say, oh my God, I am exhausted. Just as much as it's hard for an extrovert to be introverted, so. All right, guys, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Stop at the book table on the way out. And thank you. I'm good.